Materials supplied by Microsoft Corporation may be used for internal review, analysis, or research only. Any editing, reproduction, publication, rebroadcast, public showing, internet or public display is forbidden and may violate copyright law. Thank you, Kenji, for your introduction. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Yongryeol Liu from South Korea. Seoul National University, and I'm the ecologist. And my partner is Marty Humphrey. He's from University of Virginia. He was supposed to be here, but he left earlier for the emergency. And in this presentation, I will talk about how to use fetch climate and modis Azure system to accelerate visualization and data analysis of terrestrial carbon and water fluxes. Let me start with uh, thank to my collaborators. This is teamwork. This is not my own work. This is a teamwork. First, Miran and Wenming and Dennis coordinated this project. And uh, a series of face climbing folks helped a lot. Kenji, Sergey, Sadia, Bill, Vasily, Drew, and Dimitri. And my student at SNU, Suhyun, and my the kind of mentor in e science, the Catherine Van Ingen. He was a former folk in Microsoft Research. Let me introduce from a brief history of Modis Azure because this talk is the integration of the fetch climb and Modis Azure. So let me start with the, what is Modis Azure. Uh, before to do that, I will briefly explain what I am studying. I'm the ecologist, and I'm studying the water, water and carbon fluxes in the terrestri terrestrial ecosystems. Uh, two, main, the two major variables uh, in my research study is ET and GPP. ET is evapotranspiration. It is the sum of evaporation and transpiration. And between them, the transpiration accounts for 80 to 90 percent of global ET, so it is the dominant component in ET. And GPP is gross primary productivity. It is the sum of terrestrial photosynthesis. And the CO2 and H2 gas exchanges in stomata. It is a tiny pore in the backside of the leaves. But once it is integrated over leaf, canopy, forest, and global land, it forms, it mainly determines the climate system. Roughly 70% of land, pre land precipitation returns to the atmosphere through uh, evapotranspiration. There, the red square shows yep, red square shows land precipitation and global scale 113, and the evaporation is roughly seven, 73, so it is roughly 70%. And why GPP is so important? So this is recently uh, IPCC AR5 report. On annual scale, the gross primary productivity is 13 times greater than annual release of uh, anthropogenic CO2 release to the atmosphere. We, are, we know the global warming is being accelerated because of the greenhouse gases released by the human. And but that amount is roughly 10 petagram per year. But in global scale, the global land ecosystems absorb 120, 123 petroleum carbon. It is a lot. But the problem is there is lots of uncertainty. The range is from 113 through 170. The, the range of uncertainty is much bigger than the CO2 released by the human. So there are two types of ecosystem models. One is the diagnostic model, the other is prognostic model. Drew Perps, I believe he is the uh, expert in the prognostic model, and I think he will talk about the pro prognostic model in his talk. So prognostic model is to use for predict the future. And it typically has a coarse spatial and temporal resolutions, like 100 kilometer and temporal resolution is monthly. And I will focus on diagnostic model in this presentation. Diagnostic model is needed to understand the past. Typically, it, has, it requires very high spatial and temporal resolution input data from satellite, and like one kilometer and daily resolution. 
So to predict the future, we should understand the past. That is the first step to understand the uh, global climate system. So then how to do, uh, how to apply the dynamics model in global scale? The only way is to limit sensing data, I believe. And one of them is the MODIS. It is on board Terra and Aqua satellites in NASA. And Terra, Terra was launched in 2000, and Aqua was launched in 2002. And the MODIS has three disciplines. One is land, and the other is land, atmosphere, and the other is ocean. In this presentation, I am using the land and atmosphere product. And it produces 285 gigabyte per day per satellite. And the sum of Terra and Aqua gives 570 gigabyte per day. That means if we integrate over the 10 years, then it is roughly two petabytes. So this is big data. It is the data intensive science. So the motivation of this Azure project, it, was go, it goes back to 2008 when I was a PhD student at Berkeley. At the time I wrote the proposal to NASA and the title was improving global terrestrial estimates of evapotranspiration under climate change with the synergy of MODIS, FluxNet, and ecophysiological models. Fortunately, that proposal was accepted, but at the time, I had no idea about how much computer resources would, would be needed to achieve that goal. I was very naive at the time. I just I wrote the proposal and it was accepted then. But, in reality, uh, it was a very ambitious proposal, but my thesis advisor, he's, uh, he's very respectable and fantastic advisor, Dennis Balaki. He's a field guy, he has enough money, but the money goes for the field instrument, maintaining the site and purchasing new sensors. And in the office, I was just, I had one PC. That is the only resource that I could use at the time. Then how could use just single PC for the global inter sensing study. And unfortunately, Peng Gong was, could not make here today, but at the time I visited Peng Gong, he was one of my thesis advisors at Berkeley. I, I showed my proposal to him and I, exp I explained, this is my proposal. And Peng told me that you should know computer very well to achieve your goal. In the end, I developed a kind of a coupled uh, ecosystem model. It is a breathing earth system simulator. It couples atmospheric radiative transfer and canopy radiative transfer, photosynthesis, transpiration, leaf energy balance, and soil evaporation. It is dynamic model, but it, it is process oriented by physical model. And how to run this model in global scale? There are several barriers. The first barrier was data size. At the time, it was 2008. The date I downloaded eight petabyte, the terabyte from NASA FTP to Azure. You might think eight terabyte is not that big this year because the external hard drive is now four to five terabyte. But in 2008, that was huge. It was, I could not handle in my PC. And we launched, uh, we downloaded eight terabyte, but 940 terabyte moved across the cloud computing system. The next barrier was the data download. Uh, Alex and Tony Hay already mentioned Jim Gray, but I think his, yeah, his remark was excellent. He, uh, he envisioned that rate of data size increase is much faster than rate of internet speed increase. We ended up taking 55 days to download the data from NASA FTP to the Azure system. Just two months, just download. If we could use the FedEx, then it would take just one day, but NASA did not allow. We just downloaded through internet to the cloud. And the third barrier is the harmonizing the heterogeneous data structures in MODIS. The MODIS land product is the left side. It is standardized. It is sinusoidal projection. It is already, uh, the pixel location is predetermined, so it is very easy to use. But MODIS atmospheric product is, it is a SWOT format. It is latitude and longitude. So to co-locate these two products, it is needed to grid the reprojection process of the level two MODIS atmospheric product. It takes lots of time. And
And the last barrier was the data processing. <laughs> to compute global one year ETN GPP, we learned that 9,000 CPU hours, it took 9,000 hours. And that is 375 days. Does computing one year data takes one year with one CPU? It is impossible during my PhD course. So we used 250 virtual machines in Azure and it took only less than two days. So I think the power of the Azure system is it is highly flexible, highly, uh, depending on the demand, we can increase the, virtual, the size of the virtual machines. And yeah, using up the 250 virtual machines, it was very, it make a quickly happen all my products. In 2009, we made a team with this Azure, as I mentioned, the Catherine Van Ingen in Microsoft Research, she organized one team. And in LBL, the Deb and Keith, and in Universal Virginia, the Martin Jie. Jie, he is an excellent and fantastic graduate student at the time, and I think he entered Microsoft Research. We made a team and we had a regular conference call every week and GLE visited Berkeley in 2009 and we worked together three months and we, we had a lot of work at the time. The basic idea is I access the web portal and request something and everything happens in the cloud. Data collection from NASA Active, Ser NASA Active Server to the Azure and the reposition in cloud and data analysis in the cloud, and I got the results through the emails. It is highly interdisciplinary project, and also we made a very good outcomes. The red color is the computer science uh, conference paper or journal papers, and the black color is by geoscience papers. And of course, we share the co-authorship and we contributed together. It is it is very exciting uh, opportunity. That's one example, data processing portal. It is a web interface. One can select year, days, and type of satellite, and location of the tires, and select the instance of instance number, the number of virtual machines. And request and uh, leave my email, then every result will be delivered to my email address. And I uploaded the compiled exe files to the Azure, and then I could monitor the status of the processing almost in near real time. Here the processing is 28, succeeded is 2,000, failed the three, and it is very useful to what is happening in the cloud. So in the end, I used my single PC, but I accessed through the Azure system. Then I, cr I created this global maps of GPP and ET. But I should note that maps are created in my own PC. I downloaded all results from the, um, uh, the Azure to my PC and make the maps. Okay, so that is the, my the next step. What can we do? What can you do further using the Azure system? That is the integrating fetch climate and Modis Azure system. What is fetch climate? How many people, did you hear about the fetch climate? I think there was a tutorial by the two perps this Thursday, uh, Tuesday, right? Uh, I think you or Kanji should know much better than myself for about fetch climate. But to my understanding, the fetch climate is that integrates the mapping, the visualization tool, and the data analysis tool. So that is very powerful. So why is it needed? First, seeing is believing. Uh, that proverb says, seeing one time is better than listening 100 times. When we look at the text files, there are lots of information, but we are not sure what the data tells us, what the data is, looks like. We have no idea, but by making the map, we can do better sense on the data, and we can do better science. Why is it needed? The second visualization is painful, if I do in my PC. I'm using MATLAB uh, to make that map. First, select region and select variable. 
select the time, determine pixel resolution, convert the sinusoid to latitude and longitude using the reposition process, and convert the double type to integer type to fit data into 1 to 100, 120, 128 scale, and send mapping parameters, blah, blah, and repeat. It is painful. And also the limits of the size and metrics. In the man map, it does not support very big size of the metrics. So even if I have the one kilometer res resolution data to make the global map, I resize the data by 10 kilometer. So I'm losing my information. The visualizing big data remains a great challenge to environmental scientists. First, complexity is in map projection. UTM, TM, sinusoidal, latitude and longitude. The, the, the projection is not easy to use. And also depending on the questions and hypothesis, we need different temporal and spatial resolutions. Hourly, daily, monthly, yearly, or one kilometer, 10 kilometer, or 100 kilometer. And also we can, we could use different statistical properties like mean, standard deviation, or skewness, or kurtosis. So I think we really need to integrate this mapping tool like the Bing Map or Google Map and data analysis tool. I think one good example is Data Cube system. I think the Data Cube system was developed by the Jim Gray and his colleagues in mid 90s. And the heterogeneous data is formed into a cube and depending on depending on the request, the cube is rotated and the output is delivered. It is a very smart system. And I learned that fetch climate is doing that. So the idea in this project is a conventional approach. The data was downloaded to local PC and using some software like MATLAB. We analyze in my PC and if I'd like to share the result to the research community, then send email. But in this project, we aim to do everything in the cloud. Data is downloaded to, downloaded to Azure system, and Moody's Azure system is processing all the data, and Fetch Climate instance is located into, into the Azure system, and also so visualizing the data. And if needed, then we can easily share the output to the research community. So in this project, as a pilot study, we ran the MODIS Azure system for the global land in 2012. And MODIS data downloaded from NASA FTP server to the Azure. And we computed GPP and ET in Azure and reproject to equidistant cylinder curve projection with NASDF data format that is needed in fetch climate. And locate the fetch climate instance to Azure and visualize GPP, ET, and soil radiation. Okay, I hope. Okay, unfortunately, the fetch climb system is still. Uh, it looks it is not working. So. I will show this screenshot. This is the first example of using fetch climate instance for third party SNU data. Look at here, the ET day. If I unload different variables, the, the list of variables appear here. And if I select this, click that variable, then this map happens. And I think this is neat. It is very, it is wonderful. This map shows the upper, upper line and the lower and upper limit indicates the evap transpiration in this region. And this blue line is the seasonal variation of evaporation in this specific pixel. So by moving the mouse, this blue line changes. And here is month. If I move January, February, March through December, if I move this uh, button, then the maps change with the seasons. And furthermore, I can zoom in and zoom out. It is another example in South Korea. And, okay. 
this is the interface of the fetch climate. If we go to what, then here is the, the data uploaded in the fetch climate instance for the specific request. Here the ET evapotranspiration unit and the location of the tiles. And also we can select when, individual years, so average over the years, average over the chunks, and days, then hours. If data has very high temporal resolution, then we can select higher temporal resolution maps. And where, here, we can define the boundary of the, oops, zoom in and zoom out looks working, but the data is not have appearing here. And the number of the cells determine the pixel resolution. So because I have the one kilometer resolution map, so we can zoom in and we can increase the, uh, we can see more data. And if we click fetch then, the fetch climate is making the new, the, the map interface. Okay, uh, the demo I was trying to use shows the demo, but it looks not working, so I will skip. Okay, the summary and conclusions. The fetch climate enables us to map one's own data, one's own data in the Azure. And the data download processing and visualization can be done in the Azure. And global one year results are in the Azure, but the fetch climate was unable to map the old data, so we just subset like Korea and the Mexico, and, but yeah, the Fetch Climate team is working very hard. And it is still in progress project. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Jungrel. So um, just while we're setting up, if you want to stay here, uh, Lee Yu is going to come and set up. So. Um, while we're doing that, have we got some questions for, for, for Jung Rao for his, uh, his great talk? No? I have a question for you. <laughs> yeah. So, so do you think with the Modus Azure, this, this, this idea of using the cloud for environmental science, so that lots of other kind of people in your lab who'd be interested in using this or other collaborators, do you think this, this way of using the cloud? Um, for environmental science. Uh, I think, for example, I, I found one talk yesterday by, I think the Chinese Academy of Sciences. They, I think they used a, a kind of the similar platform of the Modis Azure system in their study. I was very excited. The system is used by other groups. Mm -hmm. And I think if the platform could be shared, I think, and more people could use, I believe. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. Well, we're going to have um, some more time for questions at the end, so please think, think about those questions. Email me with the questions. Um, but uh, thank you again, Yingrao. So, thank you. <laughs>